Caller in the last hour made a reference to uh, the actions and behaviors of college students on campuses across the country lately. And, you know, 40% of them, I saw this at uh, it's a website called Chicks on the Right. Saw it over the weekend, 40% of college students surveyed, uh, young people especially, I don't know where their minds are, no civics education, I guess, left in schools. They say that the First Amendment should be scrapped because it, it allows for speech that can be hateful or hurtful. And we wouldn't want to hurt their feelings. 40, that's nearly half. Ten years ago, college students said they would give up, the majority of them said they would give up their right to vote if someone would pay for their, their college costs. So these are young people who, you know, as long as they have a few video games and, uh, and, and some Netflix and uh, warm space to live in in mom and dad's basement, they don't really care about any of these other things. It's not important to them anymore. That, that threatens the future of the republic. This is coming out of the Daily Beast. Bob Sove, the writer. College students say remembering 9-11 is offensive to Muslims. I kid you not. The everything is offensive brand of campus activism has struck a new low. Students at the University of Minnesota, he writes, killed a proposed moment of silence for 9-11 victims due to concerns, insulting childish concerns that Muslim students would be offended. Quote, the passing of this resolution might make a space that is unsafe for students on campus even more unsafe, unquote. This is from one of the students who's involved, David El Ghadi. Quote, Islamophobia and racism fueled through that are alive and well, unquote, whatever that means. And then it says, believe it or not, uh, El Ghadi is not alone in his opinion. A majority of student government representatives sided with him, voting down the resolution in a 36 to 23 vote this month. There would be no moment of silence at the university next year if students had their way. UNM's administration, though, was quickly inundated with demands for a rebuke of the vote, and President Eric Kaler announced Wednesday that he would formalize the moment of silence anyway. He's one of the few university administrators who seems to have a pair any longer. And then it says, quote, we certainly did hear from folks on this, unquote, said Evan Lapiska, a spokesperson for the university. Quote, Dean Johnson and President Kaler wanted to make sure that the folks were aware that the U was committed to honoring the victims, unquote. And then the writer of this piece says, can we take a moment to reflect on how petty infantilizing and ultimately self-defeating college students' goals had become. <laughs> I'll tell you what. When I first went to work in, uh, in, in media, I worked for this man named John Michael Butler. Now, John Michael Butler had a grandfather who raced up San Juan Hill with Teddy Roosevelt. And then his, his, his father and uncle, uh, they were veterans, and they also were state troopers back in New York. And they were... They were Tough as nails. John left college so he could go fight in Vietnam, where he ended up running psychological operations, which he continued to do once he got into the news business. And some of the things over the years, I thought for a long time that swear words were my first name, uh, because when he would want me, it would be bleep, bleep, collie, and that knew, uh, well, I knew right away that he was not happy. And I worked for the man for six years. By the way, he was the best boss I ever had. I never once let what he said to me in those situations get under my skin. Well, of course, I had experience with a dad who was a lot like him, so I, I guess I was used to it. A lot of young people out there just don't have any idea, but he made me a better writer. He made me, at the time, a better reporter. Uh, he, I just He made me a better ad-libber. I'd go out on a story, a live story, and he would refuse to let me write anything down. He would just say, as soon as you get there, turn on your live unit and tell me what's going on. And I'm a talk show host today because of it. I can string two sentences together. 11 minutes after 9 o'clock. Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. It's 24. And you're up next. You're on the air. Yeah, good morning, Bill. Uh, there's no doubt that these colleges are, are a big problem with their teaching and everything, but what people don't seem to recognize is that when these kids get to these colleges, they're already products of the public school system. They have all that indoctrination. Yeah, uh, you, you got it. I, I, I saw it when I was uh, getting ready to leave. I, I graduated high school in 1980. Already, we started to see that. The changes, the kids who were in elementary school at the time, I noticed it going on. Uh, and then when I was hiring young people in the 1990s at TV stations and they would come in and 
they would say, well, I need to be respected, and I would respect you if you'll respect me, and I would think, you haven't done anything. But that's what they'd been taught since they were in kindergarten, and they still thought they were. Yeah, everybody needs to recognize why it is that the government persecutes these people who are homeschooling. My daughter-in-law is a teacher there in Twin Falls. She told me that she had uh, some homeschoolers wind up in her classroom. She didn't know why, but they, maybe their parents got in trouble with the government or something. I don't know. But they wound up in her classroom, and they were miles ahead of everyone in her classroom. Yeah. Yeah. No shock there. None. Yeah. Thank you much for the call, sir. I, in some states, the teachers' unions have actually you know, gone to the legislatures and said, all right, I see you got a campaign coming up. Tell you what, there's a wagon load of campaign cash outside. Did you know that homeschooling's bad for children? Oh, they won't be well socialized. You know, we shouldn't give homeschoolers diplomas. And then all of these legislators say, uh, you say it's uh, bad for them? Oh, yeah, it's bad for them. You said there's a, a, a wagon outside with campaign count contributions? Oh, it's a big wagon. We've got more, too. Gee, Willikers, you know you're right. It's bad to have children homeschooled. We'll pass a law. That's what's going on. You've got people who serve in government, and they are being bought and paid for by big education in order to eliminate the challenge from homeschooling. 25 and 913, Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. I've seen it happen. I want to point out, uh, we've got Thanksgiving Day just a couple of days away, and a lot of people might be getting a little late in the game, but a lot of people would like to have some wild game on their table for that feast. We've been recommending you give a call to High Desert Meat Processing in Twin Falls. There we go. I'll get that out today. Where they process one animal at a time, what you bring in is what you're going to get back. Darren Van Horn, the owner of High Desert Meat Processing in Twin Falls, he's been doing this for over 30 years. So... Pretty experienced, you might say. Visit High Desert Meat Processing on Facebook, and you can see reviews of customers there. And give High Desert Meat Processing a call for all of your wild game and domestic processing needs. The number is 734-9949. High Desert Meat does in-house smoking. Nothing gets shipped out. Specialty meats such as jerky, pepperoni, salami, summer sausage, kielbasa, breakfast sausage, brats, Polish dogs, hot dogs, and much more. USDA approved Darren works closely with local beef growers and their programs to ensure quality meat, 734-9949. I had a friend who worked at the State Department back in the 1970s for Robert Bork, and I can remember him telling me he used the word or words, we have feminized our culture. Now, he's not talking about sexual relations or anything like that, but he said we have feminized our culture. Just last week, I shared that column from uh, Lieutenant Colonel, and his name will come back to me in just a moment. You see him often. He's an analyst on Fox News. He had a, he had a column in uh, the New York Post where he was saying, in World War II, we would not have worried about any of the collateral damage that we would get if we bombed Raqqa, which is the capital of the Islamic State. He said the generals then would have just gone in and, and done it. Uh, and And we don't do that anymore. Why? Because, oh, somebody, you know, might get hurt. He said... You, you, you'd probably do that. You'd probably kill 10,000 innocent civilians, but you'd likely save a million lives. The decision to drop the uh, two atomic bombs on Japan, very similar. Yes, they knew they were going to take out a lot of innocent people. They also knew that it would bring the war to a close, and it did. Firebombing Dresden, firebombing Hamburg, and all of these other cities during the war, maybe it didn't, didn't necessarily convince the Germans to give up a little sooner. But on the other hand, it did take out a lot of the people who were helping with the war effort, even if it was just in some sort of uh, ancillary, that is a sidebar way. And it was done for all of those reasons. So people like Curtis LeMay and people like George Patton and, and people who, Bomber Harris from the British, uh, British side, they were all involved in this because they realized you had to get it done. And the sooner you got it done, the better it was going to be for everyone involved, except those people, obviously, who would have to pay with their lives. Our culture doesn't allow these things anymore. And, and unfortunately, the people who are running our schools, who are running our colleges, who, uh, who, who are now in government, they don't seem to have any ability. Think about this, though, for a moment. That generation from World War II who went out and got the job done, if any generation had 
had had the right to say, no, sorry, we're not doing it. They had practically starved to death during the Great Depression. And yet, they could have been bitter and angry about that, but instead they went off and they gave years of their lives to defeating a totalitarian enemy. We don't have that anymore. It's 917. Uh, Ralph Peters, that was the name I was looking for. Ralph Peters wrote that column saying, you just go in there and you do the job and you don't worry about the collateral damage. We have a caller with us. You're up next and you're on Top Story. Well, this rules of engagement are so hindering our fighting men and women. And in the meantime, they are suffering and maiming, getting maimed and blown to hell. And this sorry SOB, he's the one who's dictating the commander in chief. He's such a sorry sucker. I could just you, just, you just say to yourself, these men that volunteer and they're heroes, and then he limits how they do this. This doesn't have to be this way, but he has created this mess. Of course, he wants it. He wants all hell to break loose. And, uh, you know, ultimately, he does want to, you know, institute, institute martial law, I believe, and forego the election. You know, this no. morning, uh, Alex Jones was reporting at InfoWars that the White House is giving ISIS a 45-minute warning before they bomb any oil tankers. Giving them a warning. Well, it's just like, you know, because of the French, uh, we decided to bomb the, the oil tanker trucks. Well, the reason why we hadn't done it for five years before is because the truck drivers were civilian. Well, I mean, seriously. Now, if, we, if you had a, a loved one over there fighting in this and they come home with their arm blown off or whatever, you say to yourself, you know, these, these, these men, these heroes, they, they're, they're so honorable, they, they know speak that you know they're not allowed to have an opinion until they're out of the service yeah you know one more quick thing quick I very know quick I'm, very quick yes you know the, the 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 raping going on in sweden is to the tune that you would couldn't imagine what a heinous three men on one woman and you can imagine what i'm saying this is the kind of thing and then being cheered on by the rest of these men and this poor woman, throughout the day, seven hours, was raped repeatedly in every terrible way you can imagine. Well, and, and, and this is the kind of thing that's going on. And if we don't stop it, it'll be here. I'm hanging up. Bye. Hey, thank you much for the call. In fact, some of these cities in Scandinavia, all, all 100% of the rapes are being committed by Muslim men, none of whom came from families that were native to that part of the world. Got to thank my friend uh, uh, Jeannie Peters in uh, Alabama, prettiest girl in all of Alabama. Her father was a full bird colonel in the uh, in the uh, Marine Corps, so of course she would remember a Lieutenant Colonel Peters, and she sent that along while I was having the brain uh, freeze.